Sadly, his father Priam mourned for him, not knowing that young Asicus had assumed wings on his shoulders and was yet alive. Then also Hector, with his brothers, made complete but unavailing sacrifice upon a tomb which bore his carved name. Paris was absent, but soon afterwards he brought into that land a ravished wife, Helen of Troy, the cause of a disastrous war, together with a thousand ships and all the great Pelasgian nation. Here, when a sacrifice had been prepared to Jove, according to the custom of their land, and when the ancient altar glowed with fire, the Greeks observed an azure color snake crawling up in a plain tree near the place where they had just begun their sacrifice. Among the highest branches was a nest with twice four birds and those the serpent seized together with the mother bird as she was fluttering round her loss, and every bird the serpent buried in his greedy maw. All stood amazed, but Calchas, who perceived the truth, exclaimed, Rejoice, Pelasgian men, for we shall conquer. Troy will fall, although the toil of war must long continue. So the nine birds equaled nine long years of war. And while he prophesied, the serpent coiled about the tree was transformed into a stone, curled crooked as a snake. Rejoice, Pelasgian nation, Ovid's Metamorphosis. Welcome back, history enthusiasts, to another captivating journey through the annals of time. Today we delve into the mysteries of the ancient world, where powerful civilizations thrived, empires rose and fell, and forgotten cultures left indelible imprints on the tapestry of human history. In this episode, we lock the secrets of the enigmatic Pelasgians and embark on an exploration of the captivating Bronze Age world, where the Hittites, Minoans, and Mycenaeans held sway. The Pelasgians, a name echoing across millennia, remain shrouded in the mist of time. Who were these enigmatic people? What stories lie hidden within their ancient ruins? Join us as we unravel the tangled threads of their civilization and uncover the traces that they left behind. Venturing into the Bronze Age, we encounter the mighty Hittites, a civilization that dominated Anatolia and beyond. The Hittites forged an empire that stood as a formidable rival to the great powers of the ancient world. Together, we will unearth their monumental achievements, uncover their strategic brilliance, and witness the remarkable legacies they left for future generations. Next, we will also sail to the sun-soaked island of Crete, where the Minoans thrived in an era of opulence and artistic splendor. From the majestic palace of Knossos to the mysterious rituals captured in vibrant frescoes, we will step into the footsteps of a civilization that celebrated nature, embraced innovation, and shaped the destiny of the Aegean culture. Finally, our journey brings us to the towering walls of Mycenae, the seat of a warrior society that ignited the imagination of poets, historians alike. Join us as we uncover the dramatic tales of the Mycenaeans whose heroes and heroines blazed a trail of legend and left an enduring mark on the stage of ancient Greece. Prepare to be mesmerized by the tales of lost civilizations, their triumphs and their tragedies. Come with us on this extraordinary voyage through time as we explore the realms of the Pelasgians 
Hittites, Minoans, and Mycenaeans, and the later coming of the Dorian invasion, which moved the Greek world to the east and the west, a journey that will forever change the way you perceive the past. The Pelasgians were an ancient people who inhabited various regions of the Eastern Mediterranean, particularly in the Aegean area, during the Bronze Age and Copper Age. Much of what we know about them is shrouded in mystery and subject to debate among historians and archaeologists. Some ancient sources believe that they are indigenous people of modern-day Greece, while others suggest that they might have migrated from different regions, including the Black Sea region, Anatolia, or the Balkans. Their precise ethnicity and language remain unresolved, though a combination of Proto-Indo-European and Native Mediterranean is most likely. The earliest references to the Pelasgians can be found in the ancient Greek literature of Homer, Herodotus, and Thucydides. In the Iliad, the Pelasgians are on both sides of the Trojan War. When Homer explains who the ancient Trojans are, the Pelasgians are mentioned between Hellespontine cities and Thrace. Homer calls their own town or district Larissa and characterizes it as fertile and its inhabitants as celebrated for their spearsmanship. He records their chiefs as Hippothous and Pileus, sons of Lethus and Teutomedes. The Iliad also refers to the camp at Greece, specifically at Argos Pelasgion, which is most likely to be the plain of Thessaly, and to the Pelasgic Zeus, living and ruling over Dodona, one of the ancient wonders of the world. According to Homer, Pelasgians were camping out on the shore together with the following tribes. Towards the sea lies the Carians and the Paeonians with curved bows and leliges and coconuts and the goodly Pelasgi. In the Odyssey, they appear among the inhabitants of Crete, which would possibly equate them with the Minoans themselves, who invented purple dye and migrated east towards the coastal Levant and conquered Egypt. More on the Minoans later. Odysseus, affecting to be a Cretan himself, instances the Pelasgians among the tribes in the 90 cities of Crete, language mixing with language side by side. Last on his list, Homer distinguishes them from other ethnicities on the island. Cretans proper, Achaeans, Sidonians, Dorians, and the noble Pelasgians. A fragment from Hesiod calls Dodona, identified by a reference to the oak, the seat of the Pelasgians, thus explaining why Homer, in referring to Zeus as he ruled over Dodona, did not style him Dodonic, but Pelasgic Zeus. He mentions also that Pelasgus was the father of King Lycaon of Arcadia. Aseus of Samos claimed that Pelasgus was the first man born of the earth. This account features centrally in the construction of an enduring Autochthonous Arcadian identity into the classical period. In a fragment by Pausanias, he cites Aseus, who described the foundational hero of the Greek ethnic groups as godlike Pelasgus whom the Black Earth gave up. Sophocles, in one of his famous plays, presents Inachus as an elder in the lands of Argos, the Heron Hills, and among the Tirsinoi Pelasgoi. An unusual hyphenated noun construction, Tirsinians Pelasgians, interpretation is open even though translators typically make a decision, but the Tyrsinians may well be the 
ethanim, tyrannoi, a possible connection to the city of Tyre, which is a possible location where the Minoan migrants moved to. All of this comes into context when we examine the writings of Pharisides of Syros, the famous pre-Socratic, who claims to have in his possession the Pelasgian creation myth, who he says was given to him by the Phoenicians. The sequence of Pharisides' creation myth is as follows. First, there are eternal gods, Zas, or Zeus, Cthoni, or Gaia, and Kronos. Then Kronos creates elements and niches in the earth with his seed, from which other gods arise. This is followed by three-day wedding of Zas and Cthoni. On the third day, Zas makes the robe of the world, which he hangs from a winged oak, and then presents it as a wedding gift to Cthoni and wraps around her. Before the world is ordered, a cosmic battle takes place with Kronos as the head of one side and Ophion the serpent, dragon, as the leader of the other. Ophion attacks Kronos, who defeats him and throws him in the underworld. Sometime after this battle with Ophion, Kronos is succeeded by Zas. Kronos is then given control of the underworld as the king of Elysium, the great province of Hades where the gods dwell. These three primordial gods are eternal, equal, and wholly responsible for the world order. Plato seems to borrow from this cosmology in his Timaeus and echoes of a trinity sprinkled down into later Christian theology. Pharisides and Thales, who are both of the seven sages of Greece, are both known to have influenced monotheism, as they both believe the gods to be servants and messengers, daemons and angelos, angels, under the one, or monad, the source of all light, creation, and wisdom. When Robert Graves reconstructed the Pulaskian creation story, many similarities between the story and the book of Genesis are present. Aeschylus is another source for the Pelasgians. In Aeschylus' play, the suppliants, the Danids, fleeing from Egypt, seek asylum from King Pelasgus of Argos, which he says is on the Strymon, including Parabia in the north, the Thessalian Dodona, and the slopes of Pindus Mountains on the west, and the shores of the sea on the east. That is a territory including, but somewhat larger, than classical Pelasgioitis. Apis, a seer of Apollo, claimed to rule the Pelasgians and to be the child of Pelecathon, or the ancient earth from which the earth brought forth. The Danads call the country Apian Hills after him. They claim to descend from the ancestors in ancient Argos, and that they are of a dark race. Pelasgus admits that the land was once called Apia, and compares them to the women of Libya and Egypt. The Pelasgians are often associated with the construction of cyclopean or megalithic structures characterized by the use of massive limestone blocks fitted together without mortar. The most famous example is the ancient citadel of Mycenae in Greece, attributed to the great Mycenaean civilization. But wait, if the Pelasgians are truly the indigenous people of Thessaly and Thrace, then why did Homer and Hesiod link them to the Cretans? Which brings us to the next region of prehistoric Greece, the Minoans. Ancient Crete has evidence of being inhabited by Stone Age people and even small settlements that date to 7000 BCE and down through the Copper Age and Bronze Age. 
The Bronze Age Minoan civilization of Crete had a distinctive and influential religious system. Minoan religion flourished from 3000 to 1000 BCE, featuring a complex pantheon of gods and goddesses, intricate rituals, and a strong emphasis on nature worship. Its impact on later Greek civilization, particularly the Mycenaeans and subsequent Greek cultures, can be observed in several aspects. Some of the prominent figures included the mother goddess, often associated with fertility and nature, depicted with serpents wrapped around her, and the bull god, symbolizing strength and virility. These deities played significant roles in the Minoan religious beliefs and rituals. The Minoans revered the natural world, with a particular emphasis on the sacredness of mountains, caves, trees, and bodies of water. This emphasis on nature worship influenced the later Greeks, such as the veneration of sacred groves for Pan and Dionysus, and natural landmarks. The Minoans engaged in elaborate rituals and ceremonies, and had the use of many plants and substances mixing with grain and vine, making alcoholic potions for ceremonies and religious practices. These practices included the processions of the gods, dances, offerings, bowl leaping rituals, and these ceremonies fostered community cohesion and reinforced the religious beliefs and cultural identity. The rituals were often depicted in their art and murals. Iconography, such as the double axes, bull horns, and snakes, were prevalent, representing religious symbols and mythological motifs. These artistic representations influenced the visual language of later Greek art, as seen in frescoes and sculptures. The Minoans had significant cultural and commercial exchanges with the Mycenaeans another Bronze Age civilization on mainland Greece, the Mycenaeans adopted and adapted elements of Minoan religious practices, including certain deities like Dionysus and ritualistic aspects. These influences, in turn, played a role in shaping subsequent Greek religious traditions. The Mycenaean civilization, which thrived during the late Bronze Age from 1600 to 1000 BCE in mainland Greece, had a distinct religious system that reflected their beliefs and practices. Delphi, located in central Greece, was one of the main centers of religious worship in the Western world. It was home to the famous Oracle of Delphi where priestesses known as the Pythia delivered prophetic messages from the god Apollo. Dionysus was also considered to be buried here, and on the bottom of the mountain was a grove for Dionysus and a tomb for mourning. Delphi was a major religious sanctuary and attracted pilgrims from all over the world. The Mycenaean religion involved the worship of multiple gods and goddesses. The pantheon included deities associated with various aspects of nature, fertility, and societal functions. Some gods, like Zeus and Hera, would later become central figures in Greco-Roman mythology. The Mycenaean gods were generally depicted as anthropomorphic, human-like attributes and personalities. They possessed distinct roles and domains, such as ruling the heavens, controlling natural phenomena, and governing specific aspects of human life. Ancestor worship and the veneration of the deceased heroes played a significant role in the Mycenaean religion. Ancestors were believed to have continued presence and influence in the lives of the living, and their worship 
aim to maintain their favor and support. Mycenaean religion involved rituals and sacrifices conducted at sanctuaries, temples, and sacred sites. These rituals included animal sacrifices, libations, processions, and frenzies, including the use of many drugs and orgies. The rituals were performed by priests and priestesses who acted as intermediaries between the human and divine. The central religious structure in Mycenaean palaces was the Megaron, which served as a place of worship and royal residence. It contained an altar, or hearth, for offerings and ceremonies, and the fire that was lit was to stay lit and never go out. Eternal fires. Mycenae, a fortified citadel in the northeastern Peloponnese of Greece, played a central role in the civilization. The Lion's Gate, a monumental entrance to the citadel, is thought to have held a religious and symbolic significance. Mycenae was associated with the legendary hero Agamemnon, who was considered the seat of his power. The Mycenaean Tholos tombs, characterized by their circular shape and corbelled roofs, also held religious significance. These tombs, dedicated to elites and heroes, were likely places of ancestral veneration and religious rituals. The decipherment of Linear B script, used by the Mycenaeans, has provided some insights into religious practices. The worship of Dionysus was brought to mainland Greece from the Minoans, and his name shows up in the earliest Linear B inscriptions that exist. Dewa Nusos, the Bronze Age inscriptions from 1500 to 1200 BCE, show his name as the Mycenaean Greek form of Zeus, Dewo, the second element, Nusos. It is perhaps associated with Mount Nisa the birthplace of the god in Greek mythology, where he was nursed by nymphs, the Nisiads. Phericides of Syros, who I have already mentioned of having access to the most ancient books that he said he got from the Phoenicians, had postulated Nusa as an archaic word that means tree, which is a pun on Bacchus as the vine, possibly connecting him with the ancient Sumerian god Ningashida, whose name means Lord of the Good Tree, and, like Dionysus, is connected to intoxication, serpents, and the underworld. It is possible that both descended from a common source. On a vase in Sophilos, the Nicaeids are named Nuse. Nuse is a Thracian word that has the same meaning as Nymphe or Nymph, a word similar with Nuos, which means daughter, bride, or law, connected through the Proto-Indo-European word Nusos, which we even see in Sanskrit as Snusa. The male form of Nusos would make Dionysus the son of Zeus. Dionysus and Shiva are connected to the most ancient gods that predate writing itself. These connections across the ancient world suggest that Dionysus is prehistoric. Which brings us to the next chapter, which is the eastern realms of the Greek-speaking world. Anatolia, which Homer and Hesiod relay, was occupied by the ancient Hittites. First off, to show how culturally connected the Hittites are to the Mycenaeans, they both have their own version of the fall of Troy. Hurrian Hittite bilingual poem known as the Song of Release, dated to 1400 BCE. According to classical philologist an expert in Hittites, Mary Bakvarova, this basic storyline to the Iliad is told in the Hurrian language 
the story where two humans argue before a human assembly over releasing a captive, a beautiful darling princess, while the destruction of the city threatens. As we see in the plot of the Iliad, Troy is destroyed because its assembly refused to surrender Helen to the Greeks, the same character that we mentioned in the intro, where Ovid calls the Pelasgians. And the subplot at the beginning of the Iliad is equally reminiscent of the plot of the Song of Release. It is about a quarrel in the assembly when Agamemnon refuses to surrender his slave girl, Chryseis, a refusal which brings about the plague as a punishment from Apollo. The Kuthian legend in which the Sargonic king Naram Sin from the 23rd century BCE reports how the gods sent monstrous enemy hordes to attack his kingdom. He consulted the gods by omens but disregarded their message and his god forsook him. According to Bakvarova, the Kuthian legend provided another plot element crucial to the Iliad. Hector, for all his might, was doomed because he, like Narim Sin, misinterpreted the will of the gods, thinking that Zeus supported him, although he was forsaken by his god. The Hittites were an ancient Anatolian civilization that flourished during the Late Bronze Age, primarily in what is now modern-day Turkey. They formed one of the great empires of the ancient world and had a significant influence on the region. Hattusa was the capital of the Hittite Empire, located in present-day Turkey. The Great Temple of Hattusa was a prominent religious structure within the city and likely served as the focal point of Hittite religious rituals. The city was dedicated to a Hittite pantheon, and Hittusa was regarded as a sacred place. The Hittites had a significant impact on the Greeks, particularly during the Late Bronze Age. Though trade and cultural interactions, the Greeks were exposed to Hittite influences, including artistic styles, religious practices, and administrative techniques. These exchanges contributed to, to the cultural development of the Greeks and influenced their own artistic and architectural traditions. The Hittite language, or Nessite, is part of an Anatolian branch of Indo-European language family. It provides valuable linguistic insights into the ancient world and has contributed to our understanding of Indo-European languages, including ancient Greek. The Hittite Empire eventually declined in the 12th century BCE due to a combination of internal unrest, external pressures, and the impact of the Sea People's migrations. The empire fragmented and Hattusa was abandoned and eventually forgotten until its rediscovery by archaeologists in the 20th century. The region of Anatolia becomes heavily mixed with Mycenaean Greek migrants. According to Homer and some of the ancient Greek writers like Herodotus, around the 12th century BCE, a group of people known as the Dorians migrated into mainland Greece, overthrowing or displacing the existing Mycenaean civilization. The invasion is believed to have occurred during the Late Bronze Age or Early Iron Age a period marked by significant societal and cultural changes in the Aegean region. The traditional narrative suggests that the Dorians, a group of Greek-speaking people, invaded from the north or northwest regions like Thrace, Epirus, Macedonia, and Thessaly. They were said to have brought with them a new dialect of the Greek language and introduced a different cultural and social order. These Dorians claim to be the descendants of the Pelasgians themselves. According to traditional accounts, the Dorian invasion resulted in the collapse of the Mycenaean civilization and the end of the Late Bronze Age in Greece. 
the Mycenaean palaces were destroyed or abandoned, and the society entered a period of decline known as the Greek Dark Ages, characterized by a loss of writing, decreased urbanization, and general decrease in material culture. But not for long. As a result, the Mycenaeans migrated into Anatolia. They caused one location in particular to become a beacon for ancient pre-Socratic thought. And that place is Ionia. The Ionians were an ancient Greek ethnic group and one of the major tribes that inhabited ancient Anatolia. They were one of the four main tribes that make up the Greeks, along with the Dorians, Aeolians, and Achaeans. The Ionians were primarily concentrated in central and western coastal regions of Asia Minor, present-day western Turkey, and the adjacent Aegean Islands. According to Homer, the Ionians traced their ancestry back to Ion, a mythical figure, and the son of the legendary Greek hero, Kuthis, and his wife Creusa. Ion was believed to be the founder of the Ionian tribe. The Ionians primarily inhabited western Anatolia, including regions such as Aeolus and Doris. Prominent Ionian cities included Miletus, Ephesus, Colophon, and Priene. They also settled in several Aegean islands, including Samos and Chios. They created two of the world's ancient wonders, the famous Temple of Artemis in Ephesus and the Mausoleum at Helicarnassus. These famous Ionian columns were influenced by the Doric columns and then in turn influences the later Corinthian columns that would become world-class architecture that even passed down to the Romans. The Ionian cities played a crucial role in the development of Greek culture, philosophy, and science. They were centers of trade and maritime activity, fostering contact with various cultures from the Eastern Mediterranean. Ionian thinkers such as Thales, Anaximander, and Heraclitus made significant contributions to the fields of philosophy, mathematics, and natural science. In the 6th century BCE, the Ionian cities of Asia Minor, under the Persian rule, revolted against Persian domination in what is known as the Ionian Revolt. The revolt was eventually suppressed by the Persian Empire, but it marked an important event in the prelude to the Greco-Persian Wars. The Ionians were involved in several significant events in Greek history. They participated in the founding of the Pan-Hellenic Ionian cities, such as the Ionian colonies in Asia Minor and the establishment of the Ionian League. They also played a part in the conflicts between the Greek city-state and the Persian Empire. The Ionian dialect, which was one of the ancient Greek dialects, had distinctive linguistic features and differed from other dialects, such as Doric or Attic, spoken by other Greek tribes. Homer and Hesiod are both heavily influenced by the Ionians, Hesiod being from Ionian era Turkey, and Homer resided in the island of Chios, an Ionian league occupied island off the coast of Turkey. The Ionian school of philosophers also gives us Thales, Anaximander, Heraclitus, and others. Just north of these Ionians is the Greco-Hittite offspring, known as the Lydians. The kingdom of Lydia emerged around the 9th century BCE and thrived until it was conquered by the Achaemenid Persians in the 6th century BCE. The Lydians were renowned for their expertise in minting coins and their control over lucrative trade routes. The most famous Lydian king, Croesus, who reigned over Lydia from around 560 to 546 BCE, is the last of the famous dynasty known as the Heraclidae, 
which the Macedonian Argia dynasty, which would produce Philip and Alexander the Great, also claimed descent from. This is why they viewed the Greeks as liberators and the Persians as oppressors through this cultural connection. Neighboring these Lydians are the ancient Phrygians, whose famous kings include King Midas, who was given the golden touch by Dionysus, and his father, King Gordius, who tied the famous Gordian knot, which was cut by the sword of Alexander the Great in 333 BCE, when he freed the Phrygians from the bonds of the Persians. It is here where the famous mysteries of the great mother Kybele were carried out, as well as the worship of Attis, her dying and rising consort. These ancient Anatolian traditions have much overlap with the ancient Minoans and would influence the Greeks and Romans greatly. Even Christian theology would be heavily influenced by these Phrygians, and this part of the world is where Christianity would later thrive. The Ionians of Miletus would find colonies all the way in the north, off the coast of the Black Sea, and Greek ideals would spread far and wide. To the east of the Black Sea is the kingdom of Colchis. According to Diodorus of Sicily, the Bronze Age pharaoh Sesostris from the 12th century BCE led a successful campaign in the north and occupied the lands of all the sea coast from Libya to modern day Russia, defeating the Hittites and the Mitanni Empire, as well as the Assyrians. Diodorus even claims that he conquered everything east all the way to India. Here's what Diodorus says. After subduing the Ethiopians and Libyans, Sesostris then set forth a navy of 400 across the Red Sea and was the first Egyptian that built long ships. By the help of this fleet, he gained all the islands in the sea and subdued the bordering nations as far as India. But he himself marched forward with his army and conquered all of Asia for he not only invaded those nations which Alexander the Macedonian afterwards subdued, but likewise those which he never set foot upon. For he both passed over the river Ganges and likewise pierced through all India to the main ocean. Then he subdued the Scythians as far as the river Tanais, which divides Europe from Asia, where they saw he left some of his Egyptians at the Lake Meotis and gave origin to the nation of the Colchis. And to prove that they were originally Egyptians, they bring this argument. They circumcised after the manner of the Egyptians, which they continued in this colony to this day as it is amongst the Jews. In the same manner, he brought into his subjection all the rest of Asia and the most of the island of the Cyclades. Thence, passing over into Europe, he was in danger of losing his whole army, the difficulty of passages and want of provisions, and therefore putting a stop to his expedition in Thrace. Up and down in all his conquests, he erected pillars ascribed Egyptian hieroglyphics. These words, Sesostris, King of Kings and Lord of Lords subdued this country by his arms. As a result, the Kingdom of Colchis was planted in modern day Georgia. It is also said that the Medes are descended from Sesostris as well. Sesostris was considered to be the son of Amun Ra, equated by the Romans as Jupiter Heliopolis and had a major temple in Baalbek and Heliopolis. According to both Herodotus and Diodorus, Sesostris had a brother 
who was also considered to be the son of Helios, and his name was Aetes, and he was the father of Queen Medea, the famous Georgian Libyan witch, who was a priestess of the goddess Hecate. She ruled the kingdom that Sesostris laid down, and her influence on the Greeks is unmatched. The myth of Jason and Medea is given by the backdrop of these events, and Medea would become the focus on many ancient Athenian playwrights. Herodotus even says, The Medes were formerly called by everyone Arians, but when the Colchian woman Medea came from Athens to the Arians, they changed their name like the Persians. This is the Medes' own account of themselves. The Greeks would eventually begin to expand west into Italy and Sicily and plant famous kingdoms in these realms known as Magna Graecia or Greater Greece, which was ruled by such kings like Dionysus I, Dionysus II, King Hero, and King Hero II. Athens would become a beacon of democracy and a melting pot for the descendants of the Mycenaeans the Ionians, the Dorians, and they would produce Attic Greek and the world of philosophy, rhetoric, music, art, and poetry would shape the entire Western world and would become the culture that the Etruscans and Romans would later adopt from. Thinkers like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle would create an environment of learning and progress. All of these events form the setting for Alexander the Great to spread Hellenism as far east as Afghanistan and India and west as far as the coast of modern day France and Spain. His empire would go on to be divided smaller Greek empires, such as the Seleucids, Ptolemies, Antigonids, and Pergamum. These empires would squabble over power for the next 300 years, and as a result, Hellenism reigned supreme through the known world. Roman civilization would owe its entire culture to the Greeks, and the Byzantine Romans would continue to use the Greek language until the dawn of the Renaissance era, all the way in the 15th century. And the same Greek ideals of democracy, justice, constitutions and the thirst for knowledge would return in the modern age thanks to the republics of France and America. As we conclude our exploration of the origins of the Greek religion and its connection to the Bronze Age, we are reminded of the intricate tapestry that shaped ancient Greek culture. The foundations of Greek religious beliefs and practices were deeply rooted in this rich tapestry of the preceding Bronze Age civilizations. From the Minoans and Mycenaeans to the Hittites and Egyptians, the Greeks inherited the synthesized elements from diverse cultures, forging a religious and cultural identity that would leave an indelible mark on human history. Through the lens of mythology, we have traced the threads that connect ancient gods and goddesses, mythological narratives and ritual practices. The Greek pantheon, with its tales of divine intervention, heroism, and human experience, is entwined with the myths and legends that came before. From the majestic ruins of Minoan palaces to the enigmatic Tholos tombs, we have glimpsed the sacred spaces and symbols that shape religious landscape of ancient Greece. The legacy of the Bronze Age civilizations echoes in the practices and traditions of the ancient Greeks, their rituals, temples, and sanctuaries. It is through this rich tapestry and innovations that Greek religion found its unique expression intertwining the spiritual, human, mythical, and historical. 
The story of Greek religion is one continuity in evolution, reflecting the dynamic nature of human culture. It reminds us of the interconnections that shape our world, where beliefs and practices are passed down, transformed, and blended across space and time. Join us next time on this journey of discovery where we will travel to the ancient Chinese world and some of the stuff in Bronze Age China will blow your mind. Also, leave a comment on what you think about this video or if I left anything out, please let me know. And don't forget, you have just attained true gnosis.